thinking about financial freedom and this idea that if you build your life the right way and work towards it, there could be a point where you have enough passive income to cover your expenses and therefore give yourself not only true financial freedom, but time freedom as well, right? Once you've got that situation in place, now you're not forced to work. Not, now you don't have to, to work. And so I'm, I, I decided it's, it's time to use entrepreneurship, use business ownership as that vehicle and start working towards financial freedom. And that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. And I'm about halfway there financially and just going to continue going there until uh, we get to that point. Welcome to the Cash Flow Fight Club podcast in the Champions Corner edition. I'm Mike Deaton, and together with Lydia, my co-host in life, business, and this podcast, we're taking you into the training room, deep in the dojo, sharing the secrets of what it takes to forge a champion. We're digging deep into mindset mastery, high-performance habits, best-in-class behaviors, and bringing you the tips and techniques that maximize human potential, brought to you from some of the best in the business. So grab your buds and your seat. Hit subscribe and get ready to up your game. Let's do the show. Let's do it. Thanks for joining us. We're going in the champion's corner on this episode of the Cash Flow Fight Club podcast for a great conversation with Jeremy Goodrich. Jeremy started out his career as an educator by following a love of teaching. After a short while, he realized that he would need to pivot if he wanted to provide a better life for he and his family. Jeremy's now the owner of Shine Insurance, serving as a commercial real estate risk advisor and teaching investors how to purchase and protect commercial properties. He's been working with and educating in the space for over 10 years now and is making a tremendous impact to real estate investors and investments. He's also helping educate the masses as the host of the CRE Clarity podcast. In this episode, we get into the risks and what to watch for with your CRE investments, and also what it takes to start and build a business, as well as mindset habits we can all benefit from. Jeremy has a great story and an outlook on life, so let's get in the champion's corner with Jeremy Goodrich. Jeremy Goodrich, thanks for joining us on the Cashflow Fight Club podcast. We're looking forward to speaking with you. Mike Lidgia, so excited to uh, be on the show and just chat with you today. Yeah, it's going to be some good stuff. Yes. So um, <laughs> like I was saying earlier, we'll uh, get to know you a little bit personally, and then we can drill into uh, commercial real estate and insurance and then uh, wherever the conversation goes. But I think it'd be good to start start there. Tell us uh, where you're calling from and um, how'd you get into the world of insurance? Yeah, so I'm I'm in Bloomington, Indiana, right smack dab in the middle of the Midwest, and the Midwest is one of the places I love to invest in as well. So that's great. Um, my primary role in the commercial real estate world is serving as the insurance advisor and risk management for portfolio owners. I have clients with portfolios that have a hundred units in them, and clients that have five thousand units, and everywhere in between. I got into insurance. I didn't grow up wanting to be an insurance agent. I, I would imagine uh, that's true of most. <laughs> Um, I was actually an elementary school teacher for 13 years. So I was uh, right. an art teacher in public schools for five years. And then I taught third and fourth grade after that for eight years um, and loved doing that. Ultimately decided that I didn't enjoy being uh, broke and having a ton of credit card debt. Yeah. So I moved Downside. into an industry, yeah, where there's, a, you know, a little bit more opportunity for financial freedom. Um, and from the beginning, I've really focused on real estate. So I started with homeowners and then I moved into residential real estate owners. So folks who had one to four unit properties, whether that was one, one of them or 20 of them, anywhere in between, and then ultimately moved into commercial real estate. And now I really focus on, you know, larger portfolios of office, retail, industrial, multifamily, warehouse, um, you know, property schedules, things like that, um, in that space and just do it all over the country. So I really have insight into the commercial real estate world from a service provider perspective, which sometimes is a lens that can really provide a lot of insight to those folks who are in it. Because as you all know, when you're in it, it's a lot harder to um, see what's going on than some of the people around you. Yeah, super interesting. Um, 
walk me through a little bit more practically how that works. I mean, we we're involved in several uh, multifamily deals, uh, ranging from limited partnership to the owner operators of some. And so, like, at, at what point do you engage, and and what does the service look like? So in general, we want to start with an investor by having a conversation about risk management. I know that's not necessarily where most insurance agents start. Um, and I think a lot of your listeners probably listen about listen and think, well, what I do is I go out, I get a few quotes, I get some numbers, I pick the one that's usually the cheapest, uh, you know, and go from there. And our approach says to our clients, look, I want your tenants to be safe. I want your properties to be safe. And I want your purse to be safe. In fact, in fact, we say properties, people, and purse, right? I want all those things to be safe for you. And I want to help you with your strategy for making sure that's the case. And when you do that, not only are you going to sleep, have better ROS or return on sleep, right? You're going to have a better ROS. Um, you're going to have happier tenants. You're going to have happier employees, employees, and the most important part is that you're going to have uh, a better return on income, right? You're going to increase your profit because you've structured these things. Uh, small side note, your insurance is also going to be a lot less expensive. And so we kind of have that conversation on the front end and say, what are you doing for risk management right now? You know, for larger portfolios, it's like, who are the players? You know, what's your GP team? Who's your property management team? How do you know that they're doing maintenance in a way that makes a lot of sense? You know, um, we go through that process on the front end to build a relationship. And then it's, hey, I'm going to buy a property. What's your ballpark? You know, people want to be able to underwrite deals. So I get texts all day long um, from people. Hey, here's the property address. What would you put in your underwriting, you know, for insurance? And I write back, you know, I do 850 a door or I do a thousand a door or, you know, by unit or square feet if it's a different kind of asset class. So um, I do a lot of ballparking. And then ultimately, we get to the point where someone is picking up the property. Now, if we're talking about an existing portfolio, that's a little different. But if usually acquisition is a time when you're really thinking about a new insurance advisor. And so as we get deeper in the process, we're going to get some hard numbers, we're going to make sure those hard numbers align with that ballpark. And then we are uh, agency debt compliant insurance advisor. So I learned a long time ago, that the most important people that we want to make happy um, are the sponsors and the people doing the team, right? We want to make them happy. The second most important are the lenders so that this deal goes through. If we mess up that side, we could create problems in the lending process, create problems in the closing process, and in worst case scenarios, even kill a deal. So those are kind of the times that we engage with folks first about risk management, then a lot of ballparks as people are looking and underwriting deals. And then ultimately, when we're closing the deal, really making sure that everything's in place, everything's compliant with lending, and insurance is not a problem at that closing table. Interesting. What uh, agency compliance is something I haven't really thought about from my perspective, but what's involved uh, in in making sure you're, you're good to go with, with the Fannies and Freddies and the agency type lenders. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at a deal that has agency debt and you have an insurance advisor that has not experienced that before, you know, what they can do a lot because they want to show you a low number, they're going to strip out a bunch of coverage that isn't coverage you know anything about. It's deep in the weeds of the insurance world to show you that cheap price. You say, great, awesome. You go with that number all the way forward. And then when they're sending certificates to closing, this is usually like within two weeks of the actual closing date. That is when you find out that there's a whole bunch of problems with the policy because the insurance agent didn't understand how this whole thing works. Generally, that ends up costing you a lot more money um, if that agent can get it done at all. In fact, I get calls from my lender referrals constantly where they're saying, hey, we're three or four days out. This insurance agent just messed everything up. Insurance is about to kill this deal. Can you help us? Can you solve this? Now, three or four days is a short period of time, so I'm not telling everyone to call me with three or four days left. But, um, you know, that's that's one of the things that we handle. Yeah, interesting. I mean, y y yes, having gone through several closings, you, you uh, they're almost unavoidable, but you really don't want those surprises mm -hmm. coming days out, um, especially and and the the lenders being the big gorilla in most deals. Uh, yeah, when their underwriters get a get a hold of it, 
Yeah. That Everyone when, who's closed a big deal knows that there are going to be surprises in those weeks that roll up, right? That's just going to happen. That's how big commercial real estate deals go. It's how many surprises and how bad are the surprises is really what we're trying to mitigate, right? We're mitigating risk. Back to the thing I said at the beginning, we want to make those surprises as little as possible and as solvable as possible. Yeah, makes total sense. Jeremy, I'm curious. Uh, I don't know nothing about this world. Uh, is it a competitive space? And if it is, how what do you do to stand out and to what's your strategy to develop those relationships with lenders and potential operators? Yeah, so absolutely it's a competitive space. I'll give you a basic statistic that really makes this make a lot of sense. When you pay your insurance premium, your insurance agent gets somewhere between 10 and 15% of that premium, okay? So when we're talking about commercial real estate, many of these problem, these policies are hundreds of thousands of dollars or even more. If you think about the amount of money the insurance agent is making, it's a big number. I came from being a school teacher. It's a really big number <laughs> compared to that. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that knowing that, uh, you know there's going to be competition in that space. You also know there's going to be good people and bad people in that space, as there are in any space, uh, particularly when a lot of money is involved. And so your question is a really good one. How do I know who to pick? And I think there's a few factors. Uh, number one, I think they have to be a specialist. Okay, so that is, I guess your question was, how do, how do I separate myself? So the, the, the answer here is the exact same. You know, who should you pick and how do I separate myself? They're the exact same thing. Um, I'm a commercial real estate specialist. I'm a passive investor. I, I'm an LP in multiple deals. I understand investing um, and how it works. And so I can speak the language of commercial real estate. And I think that's important. Uh, number two, they have to be able to explain things to you simply. Insurance is complicated and often veiled you know, in a lot of legal language. If you have a 15 minute conversation with an insurance advisor and you feel dumber after that conversation about insurance than you did before, you, you're not talking to the right person, right? Um, I think they have to align with you in the way that they communicate. They have to have access to the best options. Now, when you're in small, if you're a smaller investor investing in, you know, certainly residential properties with one to four uh, doors per building, or even small commercial that has five units or more, you can go to like a state farm or a, someone like that. Those are called captive insurance companies where you're going to the company and you're talking to the company's representative. And then that company's representative is providing providing you a proposal. You know it's only one company, uh, you know, that's providing the proposal. Whereas an independent agent, that's kind of what we are, uh, they go shopping for you. So they, I don't work for any insurance company. When I started my business, I went out to insurance companies and I said, hey, I'd love to have you in my agency. Um, at, just so you know, you'll have to compete if you're in my agency with other agent with other companies to win business. And I've built, uh, you know, almost 100 companies that I have access to. Um, and so that's a difference you'll have to decide. To me, an independent makes the most sense. An independent agent makes the most sense. But, you know, that's a decision that you have to make there. And then I think bottom line is just how honest you feel people are. I know that's the hardest one because it's sometimes it's really hard to tell. But if someone's offering you just a dramatically cheaper price than everyone else, I think that's actually a red flag. It's very easy to strip out all of the important coverage. I have a, a claim story that I'm happy to tell if you'd like me to where um, – uh, a person chose not to go with me, right? They chose not to go with me. Um, my quote for that property was $120,000 in that scenario. They chose an option that was about $105,000. So they saved $15,000. I mean, almost, you know, over 10% between me and them. And my advice to them when they'd made that option was, look, you've got some serious coverage problems um, with that option. I know it was cheaper than mine, but just be careful. Six months later, they have a fire. It's about a million dollar loss. Um, over the course of that process, they basically, well, no, it was a $500,000 loss. It was a million dollar building. It wasn't the whole thing that went down. About half of it went down. Ended up being a $500,000 loss. They got about $150,000 in that claim. Had they been 
had they chose the policy that I had offered, they would have gotten about $490,000 in that claim. They had a $10,000 deductible. They basically would have had everything else covered. That's a 200, what is it? $240,000 difference in claim payout for a $15,000 savings. So I think that's when I say you got to know whether you can trust people. Um, you know, again, if they can explain what the policy does and how it works, that's really important um, because uh, cheap insurance policies are expensive. And I think that's the bottom yes. line. Yes. Yeah, certainly uh, in that case. And it's a it's a question of risk and risk and reward and chance. But um, yeah, it, it, that's tough because <clears throat> I, I don't know so much anymore. I would imagine it's the same. We we have been on the sidelines a little bit with multifamily, just obviously through the 2023 insurance rates, interest rates and and even insurance. (laughs) But, you know, there's so many operators that are just, they're doing everything they can to make deals work, right? They, they want a deal to work and to be able to put an offer in it, uh, in on a, on a deal. Um, at least I know this was very much the case, um, pre-2023 when really multifamily deals were peaking in terms of just the amount of transactions mm-hmm. that were happening. And yeah, there, there, there is something to be said for going with the cheapest uh, yeah. versus looking for something with, with decent coverage. Um, I know, yeah, I mean, uh, lending is, sorry to interrupt you. Lending is an example, right? In 2022, 21, you know, 2020 to 2022, we had a whole bunch of people getting, you know, um, adjustable rate mortgage loans, paying interest only on those loans, figuring that into their underwriting on the front end and then selling to passive investors the deal to put capital into deals that had those adjustable rate loans. Now those are coming, you know, due and the balloons, you know, all the things that are going on, they're getting crushed by it. I think that's a really good example of buying the cheapest thing. You know, those that bridge debt that was interest only, that was the cheapest thing essentially in the lending world right and and a lot of people bought that and a lot of people are in real trouble and a lot of passive investors including myself are looking at deals saying you know i wish i would have thought about that myself uh as i was looking at this deal and considering investing in it because now we're in a bunch of trouble because we didn't think through the debt it's just another Mm -hmm. example of the cheapest thing is not always the smartest yeah it's a great point um and yeah. And so there's definitely pressure coming from uh, rates that have been up on those adjustable mortgages. Um, there was high loan to value, um, you know, being offered by lenders. But another factor is, uh, and I don't, I, I'd be interested to really hear your take on this, um, at least in key markets, um, and a lot of the key markets that multifamily properties and commercial real estate um, flourishes in, it feels like insurance rates are also just um, doubling and, and more in some cases. And so I don't know if that's a nationwide phenomenon or if there are pockets here and there, I would imagine, you know, there's some market to market, um, variants, but yeah, it just feels like, um, insurance is also crushing a lot of the uh, profitability of, of, uh, properties as those renew. Um, yeah, well, let me give you a little history and then I can answer you. Absolutely. So, um, it, it 2022 is the key year to really understand what's going on in the insurance industry. In 2021, the entire property insurance world had about $6 billion in property losses. In 2022, that same property insurance world had $26 billion in property losses. So that's a six or what a five X increase in the losses insurance companies are seeing. So we saw dramatic increases in losses at the same time. The other side of insurance, just like lending, is that while insurance companies have your money, they're investing that money in the stock market, in real estate, in lots of other places and trying to make money off of that. Right. Same as as lenders. Um, 2022 was a terrible year for the stock market average loss of about 10%. And so not only had insurance companies seen a 5x increase in claims, money going out because of claims, but they had also seen significant losses in the stock market. And so their reserves plummeted. Insurance companies have to apply to every single state for the rates that they want to change. There's heavy regulation in our industry. And so 
everything moves slow. It's a big old cruise ship moving down the river or whatever you want to call it, right? And so 22, this happens. Everything's going, you know, 2020 and 2021, you know, COVID, all, all the negatives that came with COVID, one of the, you know, insurance companies weren't really complaining. Fewer people were out in their cars, fewer, you know, things were happening. And so in 2020 and 2021, um, insurance companies had got kind of, okay, things are pretty good. 2022 comes and just affects everything so deeply. So what do insurance companies do? They turn around and they file for significant rate increases. That Filing for those rate increases is happening in late 2022 and early 2023. When do we start to see all these premiums really changing? Well, it's over the course of 2023, and we're still being affected by it in 2024. Um, and so that's the foundation of where these changes are coming from. Uh, you don't have to be sad for insurance company executives. They're doing just fine. I'm certainly not saying anything about that. I'm, I'm just laying out the, the foundation of, of, of why these things are happening. If you scope us out a little bit, um, so obviously year over year, 21 to 2022, there's a big jump. But is that 25 or $30 billion? Is that still a magnitude jump over 2019, 2018? Or was it because, as you mentioned, things depressed quite a bit uh, in, in the time of COVID such that, in, you know, insurance claims were quieter, uh, if you get what I'm saying? like Yeah, that's a very good question. So if you look back in you know 2019 and prior, there were some years that got into the teens of billions of dollars lost, right? So, um, but 26 billion was still dramatically higher than we had ever seen before. And I didn't mention in 2023, the final number is around 36 billion. Okay, and wow. So, and what are those so, um, claims? Are they weather related or kind of just, uh, I would imagine there has to be something that stands out to, to tweak Absolutely. the number that much. So Building you got off, a couple of things. I guess, but, um, yeah. So that, so the number one thing is simply catastrophic losses have increases. They've, they've gotten more and more significant. They've gotten worse and worse. Hail is one of the most common losses. Um, and hail, I mean, we had one of my companies had a, you know, $13 million hail claim in one little part of Michigan where there was just one storm and it, it had, you know, grapefruit size hail. I mean, the there's a picture of the police force, all of their cars outside of the police station just all smashed, right? I mean, that's the kind of hail that, yeah, you know, hurts people. Um, and, and so that particular claim in a state that never has grapefruit size hail, I mean, you hear Texas, you know, Texas size hail, that makes sense. But we're seeing it in other places. We're seeing uh, that happening more often. You mentioned the increase in replacement cost of properties. When bad things happen, we have to replace them. When that's more expensive to do, we're going to have higher losses uh, go out the door. So that's another example. Obviously, inflation uh, is another piece of the effect there. Um the uh, roofers have gotten more aggressive in their their chasing of hailstorms. Public adjusters have gotten more ag aggressive in their in attempt to get as much money out of insurance companies as they possibly can. And if you look at the history of the ins of insurance, it started with just fires, right? That was when Travelers Insurance Company put out the first policy in the mid 1800s. It was for one bad thing that could happen. It was for, if you have a fire, here's what we'll do, right? And over the course of time, coverage has expanded. That's a good thing to many, many different things. And people have cheated the system the entire time, right? And so there's a back and forth that's constantly happening between insurance policies and people filing claims. And, you know, it, it, it's with the amount of roofers and people that are getting their roofs replaced, this is a significant change just in the last five or six years with how often this is happening. People that have old roofs that just need to be replaced, finding some hail damage somewhere and trying to get their insurance company to, to do it. We've all heard of it. We all, all know it happens. Um, insurance companies, you know, this is starting to get to a peak point 
And so now we're seeing insurance companies not only raise premium for all those things, but also decrease some of the coverages, particularly for hail damage to roofs. And so we're seeing that those free roofs that everyone got, um, you know, are having the negative effect we all inherently knew they would have over the course of time. So and then the last thing would just be litigation. Um you know, liable rules are not new for 2023, 2024. This is always another back and forth between personal injury attorneys and insurance companies. Um, but that's another piece that's become more significant. Uh, more states are having more um, uh, uh, personal injury attorney leaning laws. So they benefit the attorneys. So that was a long answer. But, you know, that that's all the different things that are involved in the increases that are going on right now. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, it's a new, it's always a nuanced answer. I, I didn't imagine there was going to be a, a, a one word or one item thing, but um, it, it is, it is, um, from what I understand, becoming crippling to markets and industries. I think within the last day or two, I didn't read the article, but I saw a headline something about insurance. Um, the insurance industry approaching insolvent, uh, you know, a, a, a point of, of which they're almost insolvent. And I, I don't know if that was specific to residential <clears throat> or across the board, but where do you see things going um, in terms of, you know, here in the near in the near term? I mean, obviously, it sounds like there's still some latent um, increases that need to be absorbed because of the, the slowness with which things move and, and the amount of damages that have been accumulating. Uh, how is this going to play yeah. out in your, in your mind? You know, I, I think there there's some interesting things that are going to happen. One, probably what that article was about was either, you know, coastal insurance, which definitely can hit insolvency. We've seen that certainly in Florida. There's lots of stories over the course of the last certainly 15 years where Florida has back been back and forth between um, being in decent shape to collapsing a bunch of insurance companies and having to have the state take over. Um, Louisiana has some of those same issues. Uh, Texas is starting to have those same issues in a way Texas never had before. The freeze of 2021, where mm -hmm. the whole power grid went down for a while. I don't know if you yeah. remember that. Uh, oh, yeah. That was the largest yeah. properties single in Texas. So, yeah. Yeah, that was that was a five billion dollar loss. It was the largest single insurance event uh, in the history of the world. Um, and so Texas, that that one event, you know, those three days or whatever they were in February of 2021 drastically changed the insurance environment in Texas. Um, and personal insurance, I mean, State Farm, one of the, the absolute biggest insurance company out there. So we watch them because uh, you can see a lot from that particular company, um, had huge losses in 2023, is really having to navigate what they're going to do. They're pulling out of apartments and multifamily um, fairly aggressively is what I've read in that they may be just straight canceling at renewals and saying, we're just not interested. You know, so that's all the negative as far as the positive, as far as what investors can do, because if they listen and just stopped at this point, be like, oh, it's all going to hell. We're all done. You know, <laughs> it's over. Um, you know, but here are some of the positives. One, the stock market has been in better shape in 2023. Um, I think that adds to the reserves of insurance companies and helps them to feel more comfortable with the situation. At this point, we have not seen uh, in the last hurricane season, while we did have that big one go over Fort Myers, Florida, that was really the only one that significantly affected our country. And so that was a positive. If we could get a year with just a little bit fewer catastrophic losses, I'm not sure that that's the trajectory we're on. But that would certainly help. And insurance companies are getting this additional premium, which is not great for all the people who have to pay it. But I think you put all those things together. We're already starting to see in some of the places that are more quick to respond, some stabilization of the industry and some stabilization of commercial real estate uh, insurance. So I, I'm thinking that we're going to be, I, I think 2023 was the worst of it. I would really hope that after 2024, we start to see price decreases or at least stabilization. 
Um, and so it just really depends on, you know, we're going into the storm season, uh, you know, both in spring and fall are the two most significant storm seasons. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, but, you know, I think that there's, I don't see insolvency across most of the industry. I see some major issues in specific places and with specific types of insurance, you know, multifamily, particularly multifamily insurance on 1970s product, uh, I would say is the least profitable or the most expensive group of property of any kind for insurance companies. And that's why you're seeing such big changes. If you did a value add deal in 2021, where you bought a 1971 property, and you had big plans, but you, you know, you weren't going to take the aluminum wiring out, because that's a real pain. Um, and uh, now no one will insure your property. And it, 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 so it's stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you mentioned a couple of uh, tricky markets that are the obvious ones that come to mind. Any, any uh, standout markets in, in a good way? Uh, well, and I think this is for your listeners, one of the most important things to take away from this conversation is simply that as you're looking for properties and as you're underwriting, understanding the specific market and what the insurance scenario in, is, in it is so important. And just having someone you trust, uh, you know, on the insurance side to help you answer that is really helping. Uh, positive markets in the multifamily or in the even spreading that out to commercial real estate. I mean, industrial is in pretty good shape, triple nets on a lot of retail, and um, those kind of asset classes are pretty meager increases in insurance in most parts of the country. Um, uh, office is a little strange because you obviously have either uh, some vacancy or some transition from office to other kinds of asset occupancies that, that, that that's is navigating. I mean, really anything that has a big roof is being hit by the, uh, the changes in the insurance industry, you know, cause that's a big, a big part of it. Yeah, it, it makes sense. Um, that it echoes that shifting gears a little bit. Uh, so you mentioned you were a teacher, uh, in your early career before pivoting into, um, brokerage risk, risk management. Um, was it, um, I think you mentioned, uh, obviously, there's a, uh, a salary difference in terms of, uh, a, you know, a teacher salary, a W-2 type job versus being an entrepreneur. Was that was that pretty much the, the primary motivator for you? Yeah, I mean, that, that was the motivation was, you know, the, the ability to make more money. I think, you know, one of the things that was so dramatically different that I think I still struggle with a little bit is... Uh, and it's been 10 years, you know, since I've been in this industry is just the difference in the way people see you, you know, like I, I was so trusted. I spent more time with people's kids than they did in some, you know, and, and just like took care of them. And, and there was just like, there's an inherent, uh, servants mentality and an, an inherent, inherent love for our teachers. Cause we know that they're serving our kids and, and doing the good work in that space. So I really loved that feeling. And when you go to insurance, it is literally the exact opposite. I mean, there are very few professions that are less, less loved than insurance, right? Yeah. And so that was like kind of shocking, you know, when people are like, well, I don't know, you know, you could sense people are like, okay, deciding whether they trust you or not. And you're like, yo, like, I'm so trustworthy. But, you know, so figuring out how to uh, articulate that value and to still be me, still be the educator, still be the teacher, um, still just be the person who's literally trying to help um, is something I've really worked hard to hold on to. And, um, it, you know, even if people don't see it or don't believe it at first or whatever, it's just, I know who I am. I'm still going to be that person. And so that was really the biggest transition. But the reason for the transition was, was very financial. Yeah. Just yes. uh, up, upward, uh, removing the ceiling, let's say from, from the income. How was the transition for you? Did you, were you able to make a clean break or did, was it something that you, you overlapped a little bit? Uh, you, you started your, your business while you were, you were still employed or what, what, what was that process for you? No, I, so at the end of every school year, we would take the kids on a three day, two night trip. We were, we're obviously in Bloomington, Indiana. So it was, it had to be within kind of a four hour drive area. So we, every year we'd go somewhere different. We went to St. Louis or Chicago, 
um, or Cincinnati, or we went down to the Mammoth Cave area, Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so uh, at the end of the last school year, I did the trip that I loved the most, which was St. Louis. Uh, St. Louis has so many great things for kids to do. Um, if you've never been to the City Museum in, in St. Louis, it is one of the coolest places in the world. Um, but anyway, so I took them on our end of the year trip. Um, we had our last day of school on a Friday. I went and started working on my coursework to be able to take the insurance test on Monday. I took that test on Thursday and I started selling insurance on Friday. So it was a one week turnaround from being a teacher to uh, being an insurance advisor. Okay. Burn the boats and go all in. That's, that's, uh... Yeah, it was it was time. You know, I mean, I, I had had a little, you know, whether it was um, reading books or just thinking about financial freedom and this idea that if you build your life the right way and work towards it, there could be a point where you have enough passive income to cover your expenses and therefore give yourself not only true financial free, financial freedom, but time freedom as well, right? Once you've got that situation in place, now you're not forced to work. Not, now you don't have to, to work. And so I'm, I, I decided it's, it's time to use entrepreneurship, use business ownership as that vehicle and start working towards financial freedom. And that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. And I'm about halfway there financially and just going to continue going there until uh, we get to that point. Love it. We're big fans. Yes. Was there a particular spark for you that uh, kind of put your mindset down that path? You know, I, 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 um, I, I've always had podcasts and I started podcasting in 2015. Hosting and, your? Um, yeah. Yeah. Hosting, hosting my own podcast. I have a podcast right now called CRE Clarity, a podcast about commercial real estate. And um, that, that show's been going for quite a while. And I interviewed someone, one of the first people I interviewed on that show is a guy named Maurice Philogene. Um, oh, yeah. I, we know I love this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, love him dearly. We've gone on vacation together, and and uh, we we've grown a real relationship now. But I hadn't met him before. Um, and Maurice has a really great mindset around financial freedom, and has truly been working on that for his entire adult life. But he didn't really realize how to articulate it, uh, and and he hadn't been on very many podcasts yet. He really hadn't spoken about financial freedom. And, and I brought him on the show and was just kind of digging it out of him. I was like, tell me more, you know, tell me more, uh, you know, these, these five freedoms, tell me about these free locations, freedom, relationship, freedom, time. Okay. You know, and, and it was just like kind of digging it out of him. And it was one of those moments where I walked away from that interview, like, wait, I get it. Like, I really, you know, want this too. And, and Mo has continued to, after that interview, I think he was like, you know what, this is, something that I should really lean into and share with more people. And so he's really uh, done that on LinkedIn and, and, and really blossomed in amazing ways. And so I think that interview with Maurice was a time when I walked away, like, wait, I, I get it now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We had Maurice on the show, um, some time ago and, um, he, he does great with his try life on brand and it's been nice to watch him, um, I, I don't know the right phraseology for it, but to to vet that out and to to really build it out into into a platform. But it's um, yeah. Well, what you say resonates with us as well. For us, it was Robert Kiyosaki and Rich Dad Poor Dad, and just awakening this this very simple comp, uh, comprehension of moving away from the the salaried life or the you know being an employer or an employee into the more of the passive income investing and lifestyle type type behaviors. But uh, yeah, it's, it's always fun to, to hear people's journey, especially my mom was a teacher. She taught her whole life. Um, my oldest daughter is just getting into the world of teaching as well. And uh, I started out going into corporate America, just, you know, that was my mindset, get a job, uh, earn a earn a salary, save as much as you can, um, and hope you can retire. And be on the golf course or the yacht or whatever the the image that resonates uh, with you yeah. from the financial planners. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I think that it, it would be so nice to find a way to make that more possible for people like teachers, you know, where it's, I don't know what that is. I don't have that answer, 
But, you know, how can we give people in that space a, a, an ability to achieve financial freedom? I, you know, I think that's pretty valuable. Obviously, I couldn't figure that out. I needed to go somewhere else where it was more achievable. Um, but there's a yeah, lot of people hard. serving, you know. Yeah. 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 Even my daughter. I mean, she was a director at a um, at a private daycare slash, you know, they did some education there as well. And, um, you know, she left just really because of um, bureaucracy and the workload and she was getting burned out already in her 20s. And and so she, you know, she decided to go into teaching because she loves it, uh, as, as you were describing as well. And um, yeah, those first couple months were like, whoa, my salary is quite a yeah. bit different. But, you know, my mom, she, she <laughs> yeah. gets a pension. So yeah. so it's nice uh, that that aspect of things is. You know, there there is there are some benefits, um, but yeah, it's just not not near enough uh, to sustain a life as as a lot of jobs. Unfortunately, really, just you know, they, they, it's hard. But. but you can certainly do things on the side, and I think if you have if you have you know the mindset there, I think about you know back to Robert Kiyosaki and the cash flow quadrants. You know, just just getting how it works. You know, I I've moved from obviously an employee to a self employed, and then from self employed. Uh, now I run a business and am building that passive income. So running through that process, when I was a teacher, I mowed lawns after work every day, you know, I would go out and mow lawns and stuff like that. So I think I think there's a ways to get there. But just understanding the concept and deciding how you're going to figure that out it is the most important. Right. part. Right. And I think for you, uh, it seems like your passion or your desire and to educate and to give um, you even if you don't do it right now in a traditional school system, you do it through your services and you want to educate people to pick the right product for them. And you, you can still do that, even if it's not in a traditional way. Yeah. Podcast as well. Yes. So good stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've definitely said teaching a 10 year old arithmetic and teaching adults about insurance are not drastically different, like fairly similar skills, you know, as far as, uh, there's this thing that I want to show you about that you don't think is all that important, but I actually know is really important. Uh, just yes. stick with me on this and we'll, we'll get yeah. you there, you know? So, um, I'm never going to use this. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, <laughs> I'm, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, Cool. That's great. How has the world of entrepreneurship been for you uh, in terms of just transitioning from a, a teacher? Okay, obviously, you're, you were doing some side hustles, it sounds like. But um, yeah, it's a world of difference to to ramp up your own business and, and grow it into something. Uh, what, what's kept you sharp? And It's been wonderful. I, I think that anyone who's ever jumped from W2 into their own work knows that there's struggles, you know, knows that it can be tough, knows that the roller coaster of entrepreneurship is so much more real than most other ro roller coasters out there. Maybe roller coaster of parenting would be the other one that's somewhat similar, where you just you get to this high and you're like, oh, this is great. This is wonderful. And then the next day, there's a low that you didn't even know could be there that you're suddenly on. And I'm a pretty kind of even keeled person. And so um, it's really brought out this conflict between um, me being even keeled and the reality of entrepreneurship being so uh, roller coastery. I also run this business with my wife. Her and I started the business together. Uh, she's a third generation insurance agent. So she knew the industry when I was just kind of coming in. Um, and so we have the additional layer of how do you own a business and run a business with your spouse? Um, and I think we've achieved that pretty well. I mean, that also has some roller coaster to it. Um, but I think we've done a pretty good job there. So and then, you know, just the ability to have control over your own schedule, over your own finances, um, all the things we've been able to do that so many folks uh, aren't able to do uh, because of the confines of, of the job they do. So I wouldn't trade it for anything. Absolutely. have enjoyed every part of it, even the downside parts and uh um, that's how it's, that's how it's treated me. Yeah. We resonate with so much yeah. of what you said, or at least I do. I won't speak for oh, you, yeah, but, for sure. um, yeah, highs and lows, ups and downs. Uh, we, we've gone through it all, but in the end of the day, um, I, I couldn't imagine going back to a corporate career or working yeah. for someone or, or anything like that. And yeah, we also run our business together. So, uh, echoes of, of, uh, you know, challenges and and fortunately for us we we 
we get along personally very, very, very well. And that, that cascades into our business in terms of being able to segment yes. tasks, work on things together, have a shared vision. Um, it all works together, but, uh, yeah, there, there can be challenges for sure. Yeah. I think one of the keys, you know, particularly to running a business with your spouse is just, um, creating the parameters that work for both people. I'm someone who likes to talk about work all day long. I would work, I talk about work, sitting, watching TV, out on a date, you know, I'll talk about work whenever. That is not acceptable to Mackenzie. And she's been very clear about that from the beginning. And so uh, a lot of the work that we've done to make owning a business together is around boundaries and just, you know, what do you, what are our goals? Where are we headed? And what do we need right now to have the right balance? She has a much better work-life balance than I do. I work all the time. She works not all the time. And that works out, you know, perfectly well. And so I, I think it is accepting, and this is marriage in general, right? Is like accepting that you're part of a team, um, you're not the only one in that team. And that means you have to be able to see not only the needs and feelings of the other person and be able to respond to those, but also be able to see your own needs and feelings in a way you can articulate so that you get what you want and don't just get run over or run other, run over other people. It's great advice for, um, a, a spousal partnership, a business partnership, or even an investing partnership, right? It's all about communication and that communication is two way. So you need to be able to express clearly what, what it is that you want and receive it. And, uh, that, that's really the only way communication works. Yeah. It's, it's uh, great, um, uh, that you guys have, have found a way to work that out and, and seem to be very open to it. Yeah. I mean, I had to ha I do that with a client, you know, yesterday I had a client that was just pushing in some ways that were not comfortable to me. And this was a, a large client of ours, someone who means a lot to my pocketbook and, and to everything else. And I just said, you know, I, I can't accept the behavior that's happening. It doesn't align with our ideals. It doesn't align with what we're trying to do. And so standing up and saying, look, here's what I need from you to someone who, if they say, we'll find buzz off, we'll find somebody else, you know, is like, could be, it would be a big deal it is hard. Maybe it's easier actually to do it in relationships, uh, like, like marriages and stuff. Cause you're sort of stuck. I mean, you're not totally stuck with each other, but there's, you know, there's like the a higher a barrier healthy, of exit. Healthy, than, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 If someone every, all the time is like, fine, I'm out of here. Well then, you know, that's not a very good relationship. Um, so, and maybe that actually rings pretty true for clients as well. If you've got someone in your business who you feel like at any point they could just say, fine, I'm out of here then, you know, maybe that's not the healthiest relationship for you to have as a business owner with a client. I hadn't really thought about it that way before. Um, but, you know, maybe the marriage, the, the marriage rule works for client relationships as well. Yeah, I've seen it uh, many, many times uh, expressed that there are clients that don't fit and aren't right for your business. And a lot of times they're the ones that consume the most time mm -hmm. and, and e effort. And so, yeah, it is, it is, it is wise to, to be cognizant of that and, and understand what are your values and, and what are your wants as a business owner or, or a client and make sure that fits there. And I think it also comes down to standards, you know, many times I was reminded yesterday about this, like, what are our standards? Um, are we tolerating this behavior or not? And, and obviously being in business, we want to make money. So many times we tolerate certain behaviors because we, we want to, to yeah, make hold money on. <laughs> and hold on to that paycheck. But, but when it comes down to, you know, draw the lines, like what are our standards? you know, then it becomes very clear what we need to do. A hundred percent. And if you, you go to someone, I mean, I have 10 team members that are on our team that work for me. And, and th this is true as well, right? The clearer the standards that you create, um, the clearer the expectation. And then the more easy the conversation when you do have an issue, because like, hey, you, here's where the standard is. The standard has been in the same place the whole time. The performance from you is not at that standard. 
you know, can we get the performance up to that standard or better? Or do we need to come up with a different plan? And for some people, when you say that to them, it'll be like, hey, we need to come up with a different plan or they leave, you know, so you've culled the people who can't hit the standards. For others, they'll be like, oh, my gosh, I just forgot about the standard. I'll do better and, and I'll get there, you know, and I think yeah. either way, the outcome is 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 better for you. Yes, definitely. So you've mentioned your podcast, CRE Clarity. Um, if somebody wants to get in touch with you in other ways, what are the best ways? Sure. So CR, CREClarity.com is where the podcast is. Shineinsurance.com is where our insurance agency is. We have a pretty cool tool um, at shineinsurance.com slash ballpark where you can put the address of a property in. This is multifamily. Uh, the address of a multifamily property in answer nine yes or no questions and we will pop out a ballpark quote for that property. Um, so if you just want to get a number and make sure that you're underwriting uh, it is in line with where the market is, then that's a great place to go at shineinsurance.com slash ballpark. Right. Oh, okay, nice. We'll make sure to put those in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeremy, would like to, to end our podcast with gratitude. Is it anybody that you let, you would like to shout out to that has been instrumental in your life and where you are today? I love that. So um, I was think I've been thinking a lot about a uh, friend and advisor of mine recently. His name is Billy Keels. Uh, have you had B Billy Keels on your show yet? I don't think we've okay. had him on our show. We've been on his show. Okay. We know Billy. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. And Billy is another friend and um, someone who I have um, monthly get-togethers with. He lives in Barcelona. I live in Indi Indiana, so they're always Zoom uh, get-together. But this guy is just such a good human and I just love him so much and I have so much gratitude for his role in my life where we can get together. He talks to me about his struggles. I give him insights and advice. Uh, I do the same in return. And, um, you know, he's just been a really valuable person in my life. So if I'm going to share gratitude, it would be absolutely for Billy Keels. All right. Good one. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, I, I, uh, We've had a few conversations with Billy. He's a great, great guy, recommended uh, person to follow, and uh, he's, he's inspirational for his uh, lifestyle design as well. So we're, we're headed to Europe next month um, to visit Lydia's family, and we're trying to arrange a possible meetup with Billy in Barcelona. But we'll see if we make that happen or not. <laughs> yeah, but well, thank you for cool. that. Yeah, we, we are certainly grateful for you for coming on the show, sharing some wisdom and, and some of your time with us and uh, wish you all the best in 2024. And uh, really, thanks for coming on the show. And, and uh, we enjoyed getting to speak with you. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. I hope I pulled back the curtains on insurance and risk management a little bit. And it was just a pleasure speaking with the both of you. All right, Jeremy. Thanks thank so much. You, Take care. For those of you joining us today, we hope you enjoyed this time in the Champions Corner as much as we did. Got some awesome takeaways, and most importantly, we'll take action to continue living your best life and maximizing your potential. Mindset is such an important aspect of life, and when coupled with action, delivers undeniably powerful results. Please subscribe to the podcast to hear from more great guests and get the latest mindset mastery insights and cash flow matchups. Again, thank you so much for investing your time with us, and we look forward to seeing you next time on the Cash Flow Fight Club podcast. <laughs>